What's going on YouTube? CyberOptic here with a brand new video for you today. And in this video, we're going to be talking about material mask and pearlescent maps. Now, as many of you guys will know, I've already made a video talking about these two maps, but at the time that they were released, they were brand new to the workshop and my working knowledge of each one of these maps was very limited. As I started working with Substance Painter though, it was a lot easier for me to visualize the changes that I was making to the material mask and how it was affecting my project. So inside of this video, that's what we're going to be talking about. I'm actually going to be doing a more in-depth video talking about material masks, showing you guys exactly what they do. And then at the end of the video, I'm going to be showing you guys how you can make your pearlescent maps. Now, if you enjoy the content inside of this video, make sure that you're leaving likes and subscribes down below because it really helps this channel out a lot. And as always, if you have any further questions, make sure that you're leaving them in the comment section down below. Anyways, let's jump into the video. Now, before we start talking about material mask, there is one very important concept that you need to understand. In the past, whenever we've talked about roughness, as we move further over here to the white, it actually gives us less roughness. And as we move our slider over to the black, it gives us more. But when it comes to metallics, this is actually reversed. As you move further to the white, it's actually going to give you more metallic. And then you're going to get less metallic as you move further into the black. So this is a very important concept to understand, especially if you're working inside of a program like Blender or maybe you are trying to draw these things out yourself inside of a program like Photoshop. You need to be aware that these two are actually reversed because this is going to help you to achieve whatever it is you are trying to do inside of your project. So to demonstrate this concept, I've just gone ahead and thrown a few materials here onto my Glock. The first thing I want to talk about is, of course, this grip right here, which I wanted it to be fully rough. So in order to do that, I had to configure it like this. You'll notice that my roughness is all the way over here to the white and my metallic is all the way to the black. With this configuration right here, you're going to get a completely rough surface. There's not going to be any sort of shininess and there's not going to be any sort of metallic value added to it at all. Now, obviously, at this point, since my metallic is all the way down in the black, we really don't even need it on at all. If I were to turn this off, you'll notice how there isn't really any sort of change right here to the grip. But really, the reason that I turned this on was just to give you guys an example where you could actually see what I was talking about at the beginning of the video. By using this configuration right here, your surface is going to be completely rough. When it comes to the slide, though, we actually have a completely different configuration. If you look right here in my settings, you'll notice how I have my roughness closer to the black on this slider right here. And then for the metallic, I actually have it pushed all the way over to the right into the white. And by having a configuration like this, it's actually making this part look metallic. Now, if I were to turn the metal off completely, it would just look like shiny plastic. But by adding this back in, you can kind of see the effect that we get. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to demonstrate this inside of Substance Painter, because once you start using Substance Painter, it's a little bit easier to visualize what is actually happening when you are adjusting these two values right here. For the top part of the magazine, I actually did something entirely different. If I select this layer right here and I hide everything else, you'll kind of see what's going on. We do have this object that sort of looks metallic, yet it's really not. It's more of like a painted metallic. And the way that I did this configuration was to put both of these sliders right here in the middle. So this is just an entirely different configuration, and I'm doing all of this for a reason, which I will show you guys here in just a second. But this is how I have set up the top part of my magazine. If I were to export all of these things out of Substance Painter right now, we would actually get two different files. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that we have this metallic map right here. We also have a metallic underscore alt. The metallic underscore alt is actually using shades of red in order to control the different metallic values inside of your project. 
And this is really hard to do if you're using another program such as Blender or Photoshop. So if you are using one of these programs, you're just going to be using grayscale values. And for that reason, we're just going to concentrate right here on this metallic map. If we take a look at our map here, you can see what's going on. The slide of our weapon right here is actually going to be white, meaning that it's going to have a full metallic value added to that part of the weapon. While parts like this and this, which are our grip, are actually black, it's going to mean that there's going to be no metallic value added whatsoever. And then right here, you'll notice the top part of our magazine, which is sort of that mid gray color which is going to add a little bit of metallic to it, but it's not going to have nearly as much as the slide does. Now, going back to the beginning of this video where I was talking about how roughness and metallics are reversed from one another, if we take a look at both of these maps side by side, you can start to get an idea of exactly what is going on. This, of course, is going to be our metallics or our material mask. But if we take a look at our roughness mask, you'll notice something entirely different. The grip parts are actually white, meaning that they're not going to have any sort of shininess added to them at all. While our slide right here is closer to blacks, which is going to give it a little bit more of that shiny reflectiveness that you would see inside of a metal. Obviously, this is not an exact science. It is something that you're going to have to play around with a little bit in order to know which values to use inside of your project. If you are using something like layer templates inside of Photoshop, you would want to give a color overlay to each one of those parts, and then you would just want to set a grayscale value for them. But again, this is just something you're going to have to play around with a little bit in order to get it exactly how you want it inside of your project. Now, inside of past videos, I've talked about using your ambient inclusion map in order to darken up certain parts of your weapon, and that is one way of doing things. But the other way that you can use to darken up certain parts of your project is, of course, to use your metallic values as well. And real quickly, I'm going to show you guys a demonstration of that. So, for example, let's say that I wanted my grip right here to actually be black. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here and I'm going to select my color. Now, keep in mind, if you have not yet watched my video on albedos and understanding the color values you need to stay in between, you may want to go back and watch that since we are going to be adding a metallic value to this, then we're going to have to pick a much lighter color than what we want. So for this example, I'm just going to set this to be 717171. Then once I have my color selected, I'm just going to move my metallic slider over. And as you notice, it is now getting darker. It's starting to get more black as I move this slider further over to the right. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to export this out to the workshop and I just want to make sure that this actually validates once I get it over into the workshop. So now we're inside of the workshop and we can see the results of this. You'll notice that our grip is a lot darker. Now, let's say at this point inside of our project, we're looking at this, though, and we decide this is still too gray. Maybe we want this to be a little bit darker. Keep in mind that the way that we made this darker was to add metallic values to it. And if you remember back to my Albedo video, we talked about this. Whenever you are dealing with metallic values, you always have to stay above a certain number. You can't go too dark. So I'm going to demonstrate that for you very quickly. So first and foremost, let's go ahead and validate our color. Let's just go ahead and check out and make sure that this validates right now. So I'm going to open up a command prompt. I'm going to type in Matt Fulbright and the number 10. And as you can see, this current color, which was a hexy code of 717171, is actually validating right now. But let's say we go back over to Substance Painter and we just darken this up a little bit. Let's just drop this down very slightly, not a whole lot. Now I'm going to re-export this. So let's just go ahead and export it. We're going to go back over here to the workshop and inspect it. And now this time you're going to notice that this is now flashing pink. So again, when it comes to adding metallics in order to darken up certain parts, you're still going to have to play by those PBR rules that we talked about initially inside of the Albedo video. So real quickly, I'm just going to return this color back to where it was when it was fully validating, which, of course, again, was a hexadecimal value of 717171. So let's just go ahead and move that back. 
And this time I'm actually going to add some AO information to it. And I'm just going to turn this down just slightly. Keep in mind, you want to be very careful with the amount of ambient occlusion that you use inside of your project. So now that I've added this ambient inclusion, let's go back to the workshop and see exactly what this looks like. Now, if we take a look at this inside of the workshop, you'll notice that our grip is a lot darker than it was before. And we did this basically by using both a combination of the metallic map and the AO map together. And basically by using the metallics, we didn't have to just take our AO and bring it way, way down in order to get this darker color. We could actually do so very gradually. And that's really the big point here. Whenever it comes to the AO, you don't want to overuse it. You just really want to do it in very small increments. Plus, if we were to go and check this right now, let's just go ahead and open up our console. Let's type in Matt underscore Fulbright and the number 10. And as you'll notice, this still completely validates because we did not change that initial albedo color that we used on this part of the weapon. So again, if you are looking for colors that are darker that sit outside of the PBR range, you can use both a combination of your metallics and your AOs together in order to achieve that. If we go back and we take a look at our material mask now, you'll notice a huge change in it. Before, only our slide was white and all of this around it was black. But since we added the metallic value to the grip, it has now made all of this white. So this is just a concept to understand when it comes to your material mask based on what it is you are trying to do inside of your project. If you are trying to use it for darkening, keep in mind that it's going to be the reverse of something like a AO map or a roughness map. You actually have to think of the colors in reverse when it comes to the material mask in order to get the desired result. The last thing I wanted to mention when we're talking about the material mask, a while back I made a video talking about the PBR ranges and the numbers that you need to stay in between whenever you are working with metallics. As you can see here on the screen, these are going to be those hexadecimal codes. But here recently, it does seem like there have been some changes made to the workshop and these numbers may not be entirely accurate, even though they are listed inside of the workshop documentation. In some of the earlier examples, you may have noticed that we selected a hexadecimal code of 717171. And once we actually got this over to the workshop, you'll notice that it validated. But once we dropped this down to a hex code that was all sixes, it began to fail. But if you take a look back at the documentation, you will notice that 5A, 5A, 5A was supposed to be the bottom of that metallic scale. Also, when you are dealing with metallics like this on the slide, it says that 180 is as low as you can go. But one of the things that I've noticed here recently is that that is not the case. And I'll show you guys exactly what I'm talking about. Now, if we go completely off of the workshop documentation, that should mean that this color right here should actually not be below 180. But real quickly, I just want to go in here and I want to change the hexadecimal code of my metal slide right here. So let's go ahead and drop this down. Let's pick a value maybe closer to the grip, maybe 767676. And also, let's go ahead and bump the roughness up on this a little bit just to see if it makes any difference. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to export this. So let's just go ahead and export it. I'm going to go back over here to the workshop and I'm going to refresh it. And one thing you will notice is that our slide is not failing, even though we have dropped way far below that 180 range, it's still not flashing pink. So this is just something I noticed here recently when I went back and looked at a lot of my older designs that were failing earlier in certain places. I noticed that they were not failing nearly as much as they once did. So I do think that they have changed something inside of the workshop and you can achieve much darker metals than you could previously when CS2 first came out. So this was just something I kind of wanted to mention when it came to metallics, because obviously when my first initial video of the Albedos came out, it was a very long time ago and they have been making updates to the workshop over time. But it does seem like you can achieve much darker metals than you could initially. 
The next thing we're going to talk about is, of course, the pearlescent mask. Now, this one is going to be a little bit easier to understand because this is basically just going to be an on or off. Anything that is black, of course, is going to be off. This means that as you change your pearlescent scale, it's not going to affect any of these areas. And then any of the areas that you do want to be affected by it, you're just simply going to use a white color. And then you're going to use the slider inside of the workshop to determine how much. Now, obviously, you could use different grayscales and play around with that as well. It will work. But in most cases, it's just going to be easier to either select it as on or off for certain parts and then really adjust those things inside of the workshop. So as you guys can see in this map right here, I've basically set my pearlescent mask up to where only the parts of the slide will actually be affected by it. All of these are going to be represented by the white and then everything else inside of the weapon will not be affected because it will sit within this black. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to upload this into the workshop so that I can then use this with my project. For this example, I'm also going to add a color to my slide right here just so we'll have some sort of pearlescent effect. If you are doing this on just a solid gray metal, you're really not going to notice any changes. So for this example, I'm changing the slide of my Glock to be this green color right here. So now that we are back inside of the workshop, you can see that I have created my pearlescent map right here and added it to my project. Now, currently we have our pearlescent scale set to zero. If we take a look at this, you'll notice that there isn't any pearlescent added. But keep in mind, when I was creating my map, I made it so that only the parts of the slide would actually have this effect to it. So pay attention to this green down here at the bottom. So real quickly, let's go back and let's just bump our scale up a little bit and then let's reinspect this. And what we should see inside of our project is that the slide of our weapon will now have sort of a pearlescent effect to it while none of the rest of the weapon actually does. I didn't add it to this trigger right here, so that does not have pearlescent, but you can see that the pearlescent effect has now been added to the slide. So those are just sort of the basics of using the pearlescent maps. They're very straightforward. Anything that you want to have this effect will be in white and anything that you do not want to have it will be in black. So this concludes my video on material masks and pearlescent masks. And hopefully you guys got a lot of really good information out of this. Now, again, this is sort of a remake of an older video that I did. And once I started working inside a substance painter, I could really visualize what I was doing with these maps. And that was something I just could not do earlier when I had Blender and I was doing these things inside of Photoshop. So hopefully you guys enjoy this video and I hope that it will at least get you guys started on creating your material and pearlescent masks for your project. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching this and we will see you in the next video.